Foundation in SUNY Plattsburgh. Lake Champlain Sea Grant develops and shares science-based knowledge to benefit the environment and economies of Lake Champlain. Watershed Alliance is a Sea Grant education program that aims to reach K-12 students and their teachers throughout the Lake Champlain Basin. Our goal is to increase awareness and knowledge of watershed issues in youth throughout Vermont and New York. The Zuma Scientist series was created in response to the current need for more virtual programming and to continue our place-based programming. So every Tuesday and Friday from now until the end of June, we'll be hosting a guest scientist to tell us more about their research in the Lake Champlain Basin. Um, as a heads up, this webinar is currently also being live streamed to YouTube. So if you're joining us on YouTube, there's a chat box there and you'll be able to kind of communicate with us there. We'll be moderating that. So if you have questions or anything, feel free to pop them in. Um, and this is just another way for folks to participate if Zoom is an issue. We'll also upload all these webinars after um, they have aired so that you can follow up and watch them or check in on things. So without further ado, let me introduce today's guest speaker. So welcome, Matt. Matt is a second year PhD student working with Dr. Ellen Marsden in the Rubenstein Ecosystem Sciences Lab at the University of Vermont. Matt's research interest lies in conservation and restoration of native fishes. Currently, he's studying the resource use of naturally produced wild and stocked adult lake trout in Lake Champlain. So we're gonna hear about that today. Um, if we can just go to the next slide. Great, so we're often really aware of what happens above the surface of the water because it's easy to observe. So whether you're standing on the shoreline or whether you're out on a boat, you can kind of see what's going on above the water. If there's waves, if it's windy, um, if there's anything in the surface of the water like algae, but what's happening below? To deeply understand ecosystems, it's important that we understand how organisms behave and move throughout the water column in the lake. And so Matt's gonna share a little bit about that today in terms of lake trout and how they're moving in Lake Champlain. So welcome Matt, and I'm gonna go ahead and we can stop sharing our Sea Grant screen and Matt, you can take over. All right, great. So, should be able to see the presentation now. Yep, that looks great. If you wanna go into present, All yep, right. perfect. Yep, great. All right. Um, well, Ashley, thank you for that introduction. And also Ashley, Caroline, and Nate, and all others from Sea Grant who have helped with this series. Thank you for putting it together and allowing us to uh, stay in contact and reach out to others, uh, virtually, I should say. So as Ashley mentioned, today I'll be talking about some research that I've been doing in Lake Champlain with uh, my advisor, Dr. Ellen Marsden, and, you know, really trying to share um, the passion that we have for fisheries in Lake Champlain and then also um, really just fisheries in general. So the talk today does focus on lake trout and in case you haven't seen a lake trout before, uh, here's a quick video. Um, so I'm just gonna exit the presentation quick so you can watch it. And so these are all a bunch of lake trout in Lake Champlain swimming around at a spawning site that has been found in, with some of the research that's been conducted. And you can see that there are a lot of fish here. Um, just kind of show you know, that these are a really important component of the ecosystem in Lake Champlain. And it's because of that, that they are really important for us to know their biology, their ecology, and uh, help make the ecosystem as successful as possible. So go back to the full screen. Let's see. So for today's talk, um, I'm gonna start off with some background on lake trout, uh, just giving a, a little bit more information about uh, their ecology and then focus more on lake trout and Lake Champlain. And then look at some of the work that's been done with uh, some tracking lake trout studies that have already been conducted and future work that we hope to do in the coming years. So starting out with the lake trout background. Lake trout have a wide distribution across Northern North America, as you can see in the map here. And they mainly live in lakes, although they have been known to live in streams as well as venturing into saltwater occasionally. But uh, they're mainly to native or to many systems, which means that they were originally in those areas, but they can be problematic when they are introduced. So the picture here is from a news article out near Yellowstone Lake where lake trout have been introduced or they're not native. 
and they're starting to cause a lot of problems. And you can see that the title of the article is that lake trout impact elk calves. And this is because the lake trout are outcompeting native trout in that area that spawn in the streams. Because lake trout mainly stay in the lake in that area, they don't go into the streams. And then organisms that feed on the trout that originally did go into the streams, those organisms being bears, uh, they don't have as much food to feed on. They don't have that, all that fish to rely on. So then bears end up relying on other things like the elk calves. So you see things like the lake trout having large impacts uh, all throughout the food chain. And lake trout are also, they're a big fish with a big economic and ecological importance. Uh, so this figure here just really emphasizes the economic importance. Historically, there have been commercial fisheries for lake trout. So that's the figure here on the left that you can see. But today there's also a large recreational fishery for lake trout, meaning that people go out just for the recreation, the fun of it to go collect lake trout. And they can do this year round, whether it's in the winter when there's ice on the lake or any other time of the year when you can get out and get access with a boat. And these are really big fish and they can live for a long time. Uh, their records show that they can live over 60 years. Ecologically, they have a really important role in the food web. So they consume prey fish, as you can see in the figure here. This one lake trout was feeding on all of these other individuals. And this limits the populations of those prey fish. So it keeps their populations from getting too large or exploding. But lake trout also provide food for other organisms. So their eggs and the juvenile fish can be consumed by other animals that live in lakes. And then lastly, um, lake trout really like the water to be nice and cold and clean. So they have a temperature preference of about 16 to 13 degrees Celsius, which is about 42 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's unsuitable the temperature becomes unsuitable when it gets above 16 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And just to give you a little bit of a comparison, uh, if you ever go to a swimming pool, the temperature in that is about 27 degrees or 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And sometimes that even feels cold. So these guys really like the cold water and they also like it clean. So that it needs to have a relatively high amount of dissolved oxygen. So because of these two factors, lake trout mainly live in deep areas, which is why they're mainly found in lakes and only in the northern extent of North America. And the figure here shows the year round temperature in a lot of lakes. So you can see during winter here, it's pretty much cold throughout the entire lake. So lake trout can actually access a lot of different areas in the lake. During the spring, water temperature is pretty much the same throughout the entire body of water. And then as summer progresses, you can see how this warm layer of water can really limit the amount of cold habitat that's available. And that ends up limiting the amount of habitat that can be available for lake trout and other cold, fit, or cold water fish. But lake trout populations have kind of been in trouble, uh, especially in you know, the past couple hundred years. And native lake trout throughout North America have been in decline. And there's a few reasons for that. Things like habitat alteration on land, where you know, we destroy or we remove a lot of the, the forests. And because of this, a lot of the, the soil and sediment then can go off into the lakes. And this lowers the quality of the habitat that lake trout really depend on. Also invasive species, things like this invasive parasite called the sea lamprey. You can see here how it's attached to a lake trout and how when it's, once it attaches, it starts feeding on that lake trout. And if you have too many sea lamprey on a single lake trout, it could end up causing that lake trout to die. Also important to think about is climate change. I mentioned how these lake trout really like that cold water. And you can see here, this is for a bay off of Rhode Island. Over the past only 50 or 60 years or so, temperatures are really increasing in water bodies. And this can have really bad effects on the lake trout. And then also overfishing. So if you do have commercial fisheries, you know, there's people that are out there collecting a lot of these fish, you might end up reducing the number of fish that are left in the system to a point where they're not able to survive anymore. But there's some hope. The many government agencies have been reintroducing lake trout with stocking programs. So this is where they raise juvenile fish and then release them into the wild. And 
this is really important because during that juvenile stage is when fish in general have high mortality rates. And so once you get past that critical period, you can release the fish and they'll have an increased chance of survival. So the hope here is that you release these fish at an older age. And at that point, they will be able to survive and then reach adulthood. And hopefully they'll reproduce naturally in the wild and then their offspring will survive. And this will lead to a self-sustaining system where the population is able to maintain on its own, where you have the adults contributing to the juveniles, which then contribute to the adults, which then again create that self-sustaining system. So this brings us to our first question. Um, and I think at this point, I'll let Ashley take over. Sure thing. So I just launched our first poll of the session. So you should see that popping up. Um, and the poll is, I'm going to actually read it aloud. And again, if you're not seeing the poll, that is okay. Just go ahead and put that response in the chat box. So how has understanding lake trout movement helped fisheries managers protect the lake trout population in Lake Champlain? A, law enforcement can prevent fishing in areas where there is a high abundance of lake trout. B, actually, okay. yes. Oops, sorry to interrupt you. Um, yeah. I think. This is actually the second question. Oh, um, sorry. So the first question would be the, I don't know if you are able to. Yeah, I got it. Is order. it the true benefit of? Correct. Okay, yes. here we go. All right, true benefit. So which of the following is a true benefit of lake trout? Oh, and actually there's an error in the top of this. So just ignore that. So it's ignore that top A is not an option, but you've got B, C, and D here. They control the population of a parasitic fish, the sea lamprey, by eating them. They spawn in streams and provide many nutrients to organisms that live there. They support jobs and recreation, recreational activity, which can be done with social distancing. Great, I'll just give you a couple more seconds to answer. All right, Matt, let's see. I'm gonna end this poll. What is the correct answer? Ah, so it looks like we might have a little bit of a split answer here, but the true answer is that they provide jobs and or recreational activity. So uh, looks like there were a few people that said that they spawn in streams and provide many nutrients to the organisms living there. While they may live in streams, they actually spawn in the lakes, why the name is the lake trout. Um, although I, I probably should have emphasized that a little bit more. And they um, really only provide nutrients to the organisms that live in the lakes because of that. Um, in Yellowstone Lake, there were other trout that swim upstream and provide nutrients there. Uh, that's the cutthroat trout. Um, so Great. for the lake trout, they provide that recreational fishery and the jobs um, in uh, the systems that they live in. And again, you can always go out and capture a fish without having to be within six feet of another person. So it's a fun activity that can be done while social distancing. Great, thanks, Matt. Thanks for your participation, Juan. So. Uh, moving on with the presentation, we go to part two, which is looking at the history of lake trout in Lake Champlain. So historically, lake trout were an abundant predator with a self-sustaining population. So again, that means that they were able to produce offspring in the wild that were able to survive. So here you can see those offspring as the, the smaller lake trout. But due to habitat degradation and probably predation by sea lamprey and likely other factors, the population of lake trout began to decline. And by the 1900s, all lake trout were completely gone or absent from Lake Champlain. And it wasn't until about the 1970s that they began stocking lake trout. And the lake trout here, you might notice they have some differences, like they're missing some fins here. And that's because the fish were stocked. But the lake trout didn't have any survival of offspring in the wild. So while these fish are getting put into the system and they receive that fin clip at the hatchery, um, which is where they stock the fish from, 
Uh, they're going out, they're surviving to adulthood, but they're not, their offspring aren't surviving. So we're finding eggs in the wild, we're finding their eggs on these reefs, but their offspring for some reason are dying before they're able to be collected. Or at least this was the case until 2015. So just recently, we saw the first observations of wild juveniles. And we know that they're wild because they don't have that fin clip. And so this has been happening since 2015. So it's been a continuous observation of the wild fish. So every year we see that there are more wild fish that are being produced, but there've been few observations of the wild adults. So the methods that are used to collect the juvenile fish are different than what are used to collect the adult fish. So we know that there's a lot of juveniles, but there's not really much known about the adults. And this is important because if there are too many lake trout, it can lead to trouble in the food web. So the stock fish are supported, or stock lake trout are supported by the prey fish. Uh, you can see here there's alewife, which are the fish shown here, rainbow smelt, and slimy sculpin. And so these fish are all consumed by the adult lake trout. And now we have the introduction of these wild juveniles. And the wild juveniles might feed on some of these prey fish a little bit, and they could also uh, have some competition with the prey fish, but the wild juveniles don't really become an issue until they become adults, when they get to be those really large fish that are gonna need a lot of these prey. And so if you have the stocked fish in addition to the adult wild fish, then you might have an unbalanced food web. And by that, I mean that there's too many mouths to feed with not enough prey. And this can cause the prey base or all the prey fish, their populations to collapse or there's insufficient food. And once there's insufficient food, then that means that the predators like lake trout are gonna collapse as well. So there's a, a need for action. We need to know what's going on with the lake trout. And with this, we need to know where do the juveniles go? You know, we're collecting the juveniles, but when we target the larger fish, we don't see any wild adults. So it's unsure what's happening to the wild juveniles that were produced. We also need to know what resources are the lake trout using? Things like their habitat, where in the lake are they occupying? And also what prey species are they feeding on? We know that there's those three different major prey fish do the wild fish and the stocked fish feed on the same things? And ultimately these lead to how will the wild adult lake trout impact the food web? So this brings us to the third part of the presentation, looking at some research that's already been done in Lake Champlain, where we track lake trout movement throughout the lake. So our overall question was, how do adult lake trout use Lake Champlain? Again, looking at what habitat do they use? How large can their home range be? So in a sense, how much space can they cover in their lives? You know, right now during this pandemic, our home range is relatively small. We're restricted to just our homes or maybe every once in a while we'll go down to the street to the grocery store. Um, but for wild organisms, it's really important to know how much space are they really covering. And then it's also important for lake trout to know how they respond to changes in temperature. So we know that they really require this cold water and we're seeing increases in water temperature with climate change, but also within a year, if you think about the seasons, right now it's getting warmer out, it's also getting warmer out in the lakes. So how does this increase in temperature in the water drive the movement and the use of lake trout in Lake Champlain? So, it's important to have a little bit of background on Lake Champlain. So it's a, a really long fragmented lake. So it's about 172 kilometers or 107 miles long. And at its max, maximum width, it's about 23 kilometers or 14 miles wide. And you can see how it's separated into these three different basins, the Inland Sea here, Mallets Bay, and the main lake. And it's separated in a lot of points by these causeways. These are these man-made structures that were put in since the 1800s to allow transport across the land. So going from Vermont up onto the islands, and uh, Grand Isle here. And this has limited the connectivity among these different basins. So you can see here, there's this really small opening in this causeway. It's about uh, 50 meters wide, and they're also really shallow. And so previously, before these causeways were in place, 
there was some um, some structure, natural structure you can see here, that caused some limited uh, connectivity among the basins, but there was still access for fish to get across. So now there's restricted access for a fish with their, uh, they're only able to get from one basin to another by going through these really shallow, really narrow openings in these long causeways. And what this figure here is also showing is how the depth really differs among these basins. So you can see with Mallet's Bay up here, it's pretty shallow. It's only got a max depth of about 30 meters or 100 feet, which still seems pretty deep. But during the summer, that can still get relatively warm, especially for a lake trout. The Inland Sea is also somewhat shallow with a max depth of about 40 meters or 165 feet. And then the main lake, you can see here how it gets to this bright red and orangish color, gets really deep at about 400 feet. So these differences in depth become important for things like the temperature and dissolved oxygen that lake trout are so dependent on. And to give an idea of how temperature and dissolved oxygen can change throughout the year, I'd like to show this diagram of the changes in the temperature at the surface and dissolved oxygen at the bottom across a year. And it really becomes critical during the summer. So you can see here, this fish is able to occupy all the water in that light blue habitat but during the summer, as the temperature starts to increase at the surface, the amount of habitat available decreases and also dissolved oxygen decreases at the bottom. So there's this temperature oxygen squeeze where the amount of habitat avail available for lake trout really gets limited. And if it becomes too limited, then the lake trout will either have to leave that area or they might end up perishing. And trying to stay optimistic, we hope that there's another area that the lake trout might be able to go to and then they'll come back in the following fall. So I'd like to take a closer look at this temperature oxygen squeeze in Lake Champlain. So if we look here at Mallet's Bay, this is a relatively complex graph, but the main thing to look at are the colors and shapes. So you can see that the colors represent different times of year and the shapes represent optimal and suboptimal habitats. So essentially, where is there high dissolved oxygen and a relatively low temperature that is optimal for lake trout. And you can see that within this blue square, this optimal habitat really only occurs during the end of spring and through about the middle of summer. And by the fall, there really isn't any suitable habitat left in Mallet's Bay. If you look at the Inland Sea as well, you see the same thing. Those orangish red colors are not showing up in that optimal habitat, meaning that the lake trout would not be able to survive in the inland sea, at least not during September and October. And then if you look at the main lake for comparison, you see all these colors are showing up within that blue square, which means that there's suitable habitat in the main lake throughout the entire year. So we really wanted to see how lake trout were using Lake Champlain and the way that we did this was using acoustic telemetry. So acoustic having to do with sound and telemetry, which is related to recording and transmitting or sharing information. So the center figure here shows how those sound waves can be given off and then detected by receivers that are out in the water. So for this study, there were 93 adult stocked lake trout that received a three-year transmitter or three-year tag. And by that, I mean that this has a battery that lasts about three years and every two minutes, it gives off that sound signal or that acoustic signal to tell the receivers where this fish is. So these tags get surgically implanted into a fish and then the fish gets released, swims around and we get to know the fish's story. Another way of looking at this, you can see how this fish here has this acoustic tag that's located inside of its body cavity at this point. The fish was released and it transmits this unique acoustic signal to the receivers that get deployed throughout the lake. I'll take a quick step back to the map here. So this shows the receivers where they were located throughout Lake Champlain. And the inner circles, the small blue circles, represent a relatively um, small range for the, the lake or for the receivers. It's about 400 meters. And the large red circles represent the larger range for the receivers, which is about a kilometer. So at best, these receivers can detect a fish or the sound given off a of fish that is at most one kilometer away. 
So if a fish is swimming by and it goes into that red ring, we'll know that that fish passed by that receiver and at what specific time the fish passed by there. So here's just a few more pictures of the process for doing the surgery on lake trout. You can see there's a small incision that the transmitter gets put into. And there's a lot of different size transmitters. So the one that we were using was about the size of this one here. It has a three-year battery life. And the different sizes represent different battery lengths. So if you want the transmitter to last longer, you need a larger battery, and then you need a, lar a larger tag. After the tag has been put into the fish, then you do some quick surgery, some sutures to tie up the um, incision, and then the fish gets released. So here's a quick video to show what it looks like when a fish gets released. So you can see that the fish really has almost little to no impacts. Um, it, it would swim away fine. And that's really promising because the last thing you want is to have anything that's really going to cause any harm to these fish and result in them dying. Um, so we see great success where all these fish are able to swim away and they are all able to survive. So this brings us back to our question. You know, we want to know how lake trout are using Lake Champlain. So what basins do lake trout use? And the map here is showing the movement of three different lake trout, which is the three individuals are depicted by the different colors. And you can see that they're really going throughout the lake. And of these individuals, most of the fish though, or of all the individuals that were tagged, all 93 tags, most of them remained only in the main lake. And there were a few that went into Mallets Bay and only are even fewer that went into the Inland Sea. So you can see here, though, that the, the fish can ultimately use um, any part of the lake. We also want to know things like where do lake trout spawn? And we were able to answer this by looking at how many fish are showing up at receivers during their spawning period. And you can see that there are these two really important spawning areas that show up in the main lake, but also that all of the spawning or all the lake trout detected during the spawning period occurred in that main lake. So this suggests that there are these really critical locations in the main lake and that spawning is really limited to just this main lake basin. And then also looking at how large is their home range? How much space can the lake trout cover, an individual lake trout? And this figure here again shows how the lake trout can really cover a large amount of land. So this fish that's depicted by the purple here, the light purple, had a home range that was close to 80 kilometers. So within a single year, this fish would travel over 80 kilometers within Lake Champlain, or 50 miles, which is a really large distance. But also again, emphasizing how these lake trout have used all three basins within a single year. We also wanted to know how lake trout respond to changes in temperature. And this gets complicated. Um, so I'll back out again. And what this video is going to show is how there are a lot of fish moving around and they're moving around at different times of year. So it gets really challenging to understand how these fish are responding to changes in temperature, um, changes in temperature that are driven by changes in season. So in order to address how lake trout respond to changes in temperature that are, look, that are um, caused by changes in season, we looked at the movement of, an, of individual lake trout across time. So again, this picture, or this figure is looking at the detections of an individual lake trout. So each point represents a detection at a corresponding receiver. So in December of 2013, this fish was showing up in Mallets Bay and the East Causeway. That's shown here in the Mallets Bay region. So we see that there's also this red period here, which represents that point in time where conditions in the Inland Sea and Mallets Bay become unsuitable. 
So for this fish, it's never in the Inland Sea or Mallets Bay during that unsuitable period. And that's because this fish was only using Mallets Bay during the winter, but it was doing it repeatedly. So it's always going into Mallets Bay during the winter and then leaving before getting to that, that uh, unsuitable period. So another way of looking at this is that we saw the fish entering in the fall when temperatures were low, and then it left the lake when conditions were consistent throughout the entire, or when temperatures were consistent throughout the entire lake, which is known as isothermal. And by leaving at this point in time, this lake trout was able to avoid the warmer temperatures that occur in Mallets Bay later on in the year. But there were also lake trout that were able to survive in the Inland Sea throughout the entire summer. So this lake trout was in the Inland Sea for over four or for almost 400 days. And you can see that it was showing up in that red period. So that means that this fish was occupying unsuitable habitat or what would be considered unsuitable habitat when temperatures and dissolved oxygen are gonna be outside of their optimal range. So this is really interesting information that says lake trout might actually be able to tolerate higher temperatures than we're expecting. And therefore they might be within locations like the Inland Sea or Mallets Bay during times when we wouldn't expect them to be there. So coming back to our original question for this uh, research, how do lake trout use Lake Champlain? We wanted to know what habitat do they use? So we were able to, use, or able to answer that. We know that they use all three basins, but they mainly use the main lake. And we were also able to identify critical spawning locations, those two major spawning points that a lot of fish were going to in the main lake. And that's important because we need to know where those habitats are so we can help protect those habitats. We also were able to answer how large their home range can be. We know that these lake trout are able to occupy up to 80 kilometers, a really large distance. And then we also looked at how they respond to changes in temperature that are associated with the changes in season. So going from cool during the winter and spring and then warming up throughout the summer and through the fall. And we saw these two different behaviors. There, was, there were the individuals that avoided using Mallets Bay when it got too warm. So they only went in there when it was the cool winter period and they left when the water temperature was consistent throughout the entire lake. And then there were the ones that were able to persevere. They survived through that warm period in the Inland Sea. So this brings us to our second question, which was, or which is, uh, how has understanding lake trap movement helped fisheries managers protect lake trap population in Lake Champlain? And it looks like Ashley has put the poll up again. Great, so I just relaunched that poll. So, and Matt did a great job reading the question. And so I'll just read some of the potential answers. Law enforcement can prevent fishing in areas where there is a high abundance of lake trout, local spawning locations that are critical for offspring production, remove barriers that prevent lake trout, trout from accessing important habitat and determine the best local locations to stock lake trout. We've got, people are feeling a little split here. Let's see how it shapes out. And again, if you're not seeing this pop up, um, just go ahead and put it in the chat box. And if you're joining us via YouTube, go ahead and toss your answer in the chat box as well. All right, I'm going to end our poll here and share our results. Matt, you want to talk us through this? Sure, I had to unmute my mic there for a second. So yeah, so it looks like the majority of people um, selected answer B which is the correct answer. So we were able to locate spawning locations that are critical for that offspring production. So we, there were those two major spawning points that we were able to find. And while this research can lead to the other, um, or can ultimately lead to the other answers as well, right? You, law enforcement could potentially prevent fishing in areas where there's a high abundance of lake trout. Um, that's not something that has been done in this lake and likely won't happen in the future. Um, also removing barriers. So there are things like the causeways that are in place that could be a barrier, but it didn't look like they were barriers in this case because the fish were still able to pass through those openings. And then also for determining the best locations to stock, it's possible that lake trout might go to habitats that provide the best conditions. So if those habitats do provide the best conditions, you might be able to uh, have better success with stocking the lake trout there. 
but that is something that can't be determined alone just by looking at where the lake trout are going. There are other studies that would have to be done as well. All right, so this brings us to our fourth and final part, which looks at the future research. So there's still a lot of questions that need to be addressed. And so there are many research projects that are ready to begin. And these include locating the adult wild lake trout and estimating their abundance. So we were able to look at the stock lake trout with the previous study and looking at the adult stock lake trout, but we still don't really know much about the adult wild lake trout or where they are. So this is a project that's gonna be done with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife or biologists from Vermont Fish and Wildlife, the local uh, state um, agency here, as well as with uh, us at, UV at UVM. And then we also want to track the three-dimensional movement of the wild lake trout. So there are some transmitters that are able to detect the pressure, which can then be converted to depth. So we'll be able to know at what location in the water body are the fish occupying. And then also investigating things like their year-round diet. What are these lake trout feeding on throughout the year? So just some quick slides to go over how these projects are gonna be conducted. For capturing the lake trout, we'll be looking for uh, the wild adult lake trout. And this will be done by using gill nets, which are these nets that are set along the bottom of the lake. And I have another quick video here to show what it looks like when you pull these nets up. So you can see how the lake trout get caught in the net. And if you have the net set for a short amount of time, the lake trout will all be fine and they can get released afterwards after you do your assessments on them. And you can also see how we can look at where there's the most density or the highest density, the most number of fish per year to really identify the key locations to set these nets. Now this information is for the stock lake trout, not for the wild lake trout. So it's possible that the wild lake trout might have a different location than the stock lake trout or they might occupy different locations. But this at least gives us a starting point of where we can look for the adult wild lake trout. And then looking at the three-dimensional movement, uh, we wanna know, are there any differences in the distributions based on depth? So this fun video shows fish coming out of the water, um, this, the manta rays here. But rather than think about fish coming out of the water, we wanna think about the fish, how far under the water they go, how deep are they going? Maybe there's some differences between the adult stocked and adult wild lake trout. And that would be really important for us to know. And then lastly, looking at the stomach content. So there's ways that you can look at stomach contents without uh, having to kill the fish. And this is with gastric lavage. Essentially, we're making the fish puke up whatever is in their stomachs. So here's a, a quick video to show with this individual. So a relatively small lake trout you pump water into their stomachs. And once there's enough pressure in the stomachs, then the fish will end up regurgitating or puking up whatever was inside. And so in this video here, you can see there are these really small organisms that are living in the water that this lake trout was feeding on. Uh, another video here shows how a larger lake trout might have a slightly different diet. So you can see that there's some larger prey for the, the larger lake trout. And this would be really interesting to see with the lake trout in Lake Champlain to know, are there similar patterns? Are the different, different size lake trout having a different diet composition and how that really will impact the rest of the food web? So from this future work, we have some expected outcomes. Uh, we wanna know where are the wild adult lake trout? Where are they going? We know that there are juveniles that are wild and we expect that they're surviving to adulthood, but the current surveys that locate or that capture the adult lake trout aren't finding many wild or unclipped lake trout. So this suggests that either the wild adult lake trout are going elsewhere, they're not being captured in the current techniques, or there's something that's happening before they reach adulthood, something that's causing them to die. And that's something that we really wanna look at. We also wanna know what types of habitat do both the wild and stock lake trout use. We have an idea for the stock lake trout, but now we wanna get an idea of that three-dimensional habitat, knowing 
if there's any differences in the depth distribution of the stocked and the wild lake trout. And then lastly, what are the lake trout eating? We know that there's those three major prey fish, the owlwife, the rainbow smelt, and the, round, and the uh, slimy sculpin. And we want to know, are they eating the same things? Are the wild lake trout and the stocked lake trout, are they consuming the same things? Or are there potentially differences in their diet? And this gets really important because there might be some competition that's going on between the stocked fish and the wild fish. If the stocked fish are using the same exact resources as the wild fish, then this might be causing the wild fish to have potentially increased mortality or they're not surviving, or they might have to use different resources. They might have to go to different locations. So these are all um, expected outcomes or questions that we're hoping to address with this future work. And it's work that will be very exciting. We'll use a lot of the techniques that I went over today. And we're hoping that uh, as soon as this pandemic passes over, we'll be able to get back out there and continue capturing the fish that we love to work with. So with that, I want to wish everyone a happy Earth Week. And um, I think Ashley is going to take over and potentially open the floor for some questions. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Matt. Huge round of virtual applause for that. That is fascinating. It's so neat to see what the lake trout are doing and where they are. And it's also really interesting just to see how you gather that information. So whether you just like to fish lake trout or, um, you know, or you're taking the scientific approach, it's interesting to hear kind of how all those pieces really come together. So we are going to open it up for questions right now. And so we'll go ahead and share our screen. Um, and so there's been some awesome questions coming into the chat, uh, into the Q and A box, keep tossing those in there. And then, um, before you all head out after this, we actually have a poll for you all to fill out. Um, so stick around. All right. My first question for you, Matt, actually is just, could you share with us, how did you get involved in fisheries, um, research and what was your path, um, kind of to where you are today? Yeah, it's a, a great question. So. I guess my path really started when I was a little kid. Uh, I was fortunate and had access to some local water bodies. And, you know, from the time I could hold a fishing pole, I was out on the water. And I've just always had a passion for um, the natural environment. And so that led me through to college where I went to undergrad in a program that offered environmental science and ecology. And at that point, I was focusing both on aquatic and terrestrial ecology, and I wasn't really sure which route I wanted to go on when I first started, whether I wanted to stay more terrestrial, working with animals on land or aquatic and working with some, more like fish. And so it took a, a few years of um, experience helping out in some different labs. And I got to really appreciate the ecology of fish. And um, I then went on to do a master's out at the same college where I did my undergrad out in Western New York. Um, and did some more research on fish in Lake Ontario, as well as some of the Finger Lakes in New York. And uh, in doing that research, I got to meet my current advisor, Dr. Ellen Marsden, and saw that she was doing some great research here in Lake Champlain and that, you know, the lake trout population here is having some really interesting um, changes and some positive changes. You know, there's a, a native species that's starting to show potential for self sustaining population. So that led me to coming here to hope I can work with this uh, success story and continue to make it more successful in the future. So. All right, That's great, great, Matt. Go ahead, Carolyn. Uh, so we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A box. So we're gonna start with one um, that got a couple thumbs up and it says, were all the tagged fish released in the same location on the same lake? Great, yeah, great question. So there were actually two tagging locations, but they were all for Lake Champlain. So the stocked fish were collected from those two critical spawning grounds. Um, and we had some previous idea or previous knowledge that those areas had a lot of adult fish there. So they're at the northern part and the southern part of that main lake basin in Lake Champlain. So that's where all the lake trout were collected from and about half were stocked or half were um, that received the tags were put in at that northern location and half were put in at that southern location. Great. Awesome. And we have another question here that's asking about what types of procedures do you take um, 
to make sure that the fish doesn't die in the process of, I'm assuming, implanting the tag and then releasing? Yeah, great question. So it's really, uh, it can be a stressful period. Um, so we try to keep the fish under as little stress as possible. So when we first get the fish on board or on, into the boat, we'll have it in a holding pen just to check the conditions. And we wanna make sure that the fish is looking healthy and is able to swim upright and everything before we might even do any surgery. So if the fish is showing signs of being healthy, then uh, we'll actually use um, a small electric shock that will stun the fish. And so that allows us to do the surgery without having the fish move around, which helps everyone. It helps the fish because you know we're not gonna be injuring the fish any more than we need to. And the fish isn't gonna be kicking us when we have a sharp scalpel in our hand and causing us to cut ourselves. And the, the electric pulse causes no harm to the fish at all. Once the, you take the pulse off, the fish goes back to normal. And also during this time, we have a water pump that's putting water over the fish's gills. So it's a way of allowing the fish to continue to get oxygen. And then after we have the uh, surgery done, it shouldn't take, any, shouldn't take more than two minutes. Uh, we have the fish back in a holding pen to make sure that it's doing well. And once it's showing signs that's doing well, it gets released. All right, great. Um, going down the list of questions, we've got one about um, if gillnet is if a gillnet is set at the bottom of the lake, is this actually an accurate recording of how many and different types of trout are in the area? And then it kind of follows through with perhaps asking how high net extend from bottom is a more dialed in question. So I guess net location maybe. Yeah, yeah, great question. So I guess uh, one part I'll address first is looking at the different types of trout. So if you're thinking about wild versus stock, it's definitely um, something that the net might not accurately answer. It only sits about six feet off the bottom, which is really a small amount. Um, and so there's some previous knowledge that, you know, especially during the summer period, lake trout will remain in that deeper water where it's really gonna be cold. They'll lay low down close to the bottom. So it should target lake trout pretty well without getting other species of trout. And another thing that we're gonna to try to do is put the nets at different depths. So in, by that, I mean, we'll set the net at the bottom where it's 30 meters, at the bottom where it's 40 meters, 50 meters, and kind of do some random sampling to try to get as diverse of a catch as possible and capture if there are any differences in the depth distribution of the lake trout. Great, and then there's another question here that's asking um, about so you're able, it's asking, are you able to tag wild lake trout? Which yes, you are. But I'm curious, I'm gonna add another question to that. If you're, a, if you're someone that fishes often and you're catching lake trout, would you be able to tell if there was a tag in, uh, in a fish that you caught out on Lake Champlain and how? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So each fish that receives this internal tag will also get an external tag. It's a very small, um, orange piece of plastic that comes out of the fish. So it has to be small so it doesn't influence the fish's movement, but it's still, it's like a fluorescent green. So if you do catch it, this will be sticking out of the fish and it'll have some contact information on it as well. Um, so there was actually on that video where the fish was getting released, that fish had that green tag on it. And, you know, see, look at the video quickly. It, it doesn't even show up, which Ideally, that's what you want for the fish because you don't want it to impact it. But if you did catch this fish, you would see that green tag. Great. And just for folks out there that are curious, this green tag is where on the fish, Matt? Right. So this green tag, it sticks out um, on the top side of the fish. It'll be right by that, uh, the fin, the really large dorsal fin um, in the middle of the fish on the top section. Cool. Thanks. All right, next question. We've got two more left on this unless some people throw in some extra questions. Um, but it says, is lake trout behavior any different in places like Wyoming or other places than in Lake Champlain? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And it's something that it really can depend. So we know that there's a lot of factors that drive the lake trout movement. Things like um, location of their prey and you saw how the temperature and dissolved oxygen might change their distribution. So it's something where you'd have to know more about the individual systems. Um, in general, lake trout probably have similar um, patterns like their home range. Lake trout will generally 
occupy areas close to that 80 kilometers or 50 miles, but some uh, studies have shown they can occupy as much as 200 kilometers. So that's over in the Great Lakes. There are very few lakes that have that much area available to allow lake trout to move around. Um, also, there might be changes in the movement of the prey fish that could drive the um, location of the lake trout. So it's something where the, the basic behaviors, like the responses to temperature and like the total um, area or the home range of the lake trout could be um, similar to other uh, systems like over in Wisconsin or Wyoming. Um, but you'd have to look at all the variables together to really know how the fish are moving around. Great. And then we had a, just a follow up here from someone uh, in YouTube, but then also in our Q and A here, they're asking if you could just reiterate where you got your bachelor's degree um, and where you got your master's degree. Yeah. So uh, I forgot to mention that I got my bachelor's and master's from SUNY Brockport out in Western New York. So awesome. I've got a, a great environmental program there where you can go on different tracks where whether you want to do aquatic, terrestrial, wetland, all different options. Great. Awesome. We'll Thanks. Plug for them. Yep. And then one last question. We'll just do this one real fast and then I'm going to share a little bit of information. Just asking about can the existing sensors used to detect can existing sensors used to detect fish depth using 3D? From the map, it appears these sensors are rel were in relatively shallow water close to, or close to shore. Yeah, so the receivers, um, they're, we keep them relatively close to shore, but they're actually anywhere from, I think, 20 meters to 60 meters deep. Um, so the shores of Lake Champlain drop off relatively quickly. And even if a fish does come up to the surface, essentially, these pressure gauges will be able to detect that anywhere from the surface down to the bottom of the lake. Awesome, thank you. Well, again, virtual round of applause for Matt. Awesome job today. And thanks so much for sharing about the really important work you're doing on Lake Champlain with Lake Trout. Um, totally fascinating. We just launched a feedback poll. So if folks wanna go in and just put in some feedback about today's session. We wanna hear from you and your experience. Um, we've got many more of these lined up and so it helps us make sure that you know the next um, series is even better. And so while you're filling out that feedback poll, I'm just gonna talk about one cool thing you could do at home if you were pretty psyched about um, the lake trout today. And so our take home activity for today's session is going to be to use US Fish and Wildlife's freshwater fish page. And so we're gonna post the link to this in the chat box. Um, and on this page, basically, you can see from the icon on the right, you can look at tons of different freshwater fish. And so a lot of these fish live in Lake Champlain. Some of them do not. However, um, basically what you can do is, um, oh, okay, great. Um, what you can do is click on one of those fish and it tells you a whole bunch of information about it. You can then use that information to kind of sketch. So think about what kind of habitat it's gonna live in um, and where you might find this fish right now in the springtime, what it might be doing, what it might be eating. Um, if you go ahead and do some of that um, research and art, go ahead and share it with us on Instagram and Facebook. We wanna see it. And then next time, and I'm gonna post that link in the chat in just a second here, and then we just wanna invite you to our session next week. So next week we are gonna be talking about 